Good morning. My name is Enrique Walker. I'm the director of the Advanced Architectural Design Program at the school. And uh, on behalf of Amal and Rouse, the dean, I'd like to welcome you all to the event. Um, I would also like to thank um, Jose Araguez and Aaron White for uh, organizing this event. And of course, all the participants for uh, joining us throughout the day. Um, since I'm one of those participants, I wouldn't want to say too much from the lectern at this stage. All I'd like to say is that, in fact, as director of the post-professional uh, program at the school, which focuses on design and the interplay between uh, buildings and arguments, I'm delighted uh, with taking part with this, uh, this event. So without further ado, Jose Araguez. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jose Araguez. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in architecture at uh, Princeton University. Um, and um, I'm uh, thrilled uh, to be here today and um, to get a chance to celebrate architecture through discussion, which is what uh, ultimately we are uh, 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 here to do today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to um, uh, Dean Amalan Drauz for her generous support uh, throughout the uh, organization process, and to uh, Edika Walker for welcoming us today, but also because it was uh, with him, um, with whom conversations leading up to the event started about uh, three years ago. Um, and um, to Aaron White, of course, my partner in crime for, for this installment, um, to everybody here at GSAP uh, that made it uh, possible, uh, to, uh, that made this even possible, to uh, David, um, Stephanie, Sonia, Matt, uh, Gavin, Aiste, um, and uh, to everybody else for coming today and for whoever is watching us uh, online. Now, uh, this symposium is actually the uh, uh, second in a series on the same theme that we started last June at the AA. Here you have uh, some images um, of that event. Um, we had uh, Adrian Forti, um, Tom Weaver, John Mark Morrow, uh, Mario Carpo, um, uh, Mark Cassins, Manuel Lathuri, uh, Brett Steele. And um, it is actually a project that I started uh, with the question whether we discuss uh, architectural design in PhD programs? So uh, actually a very simple question. Now, um, uh, how do we get here? So I'm gonna do this very quickly, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to unpack and to further discuss uh, some more issues uh, later today. So if we go back in time, um, uh, we can identify a uh, central moment in the mid to uh, late 1960s which determined uh, to a large degree uh, the sphere of history theory criticism the way we have it today. It was then that architectural discourse underwent a major transformation caused by the uh, unprecedented self-awareness of the role of theory for uh, constructing architectural disciplinary culture. Now, this transformation was grounded in an opening up of um, the discipline to other systems of thought, such as semiotics, psychoanalysis, Marxism, post-structuralism, etc. Now, as a result of that, in my view, two discursive dynamics became uh, prevalent and are still prevalent to this day. Um, the first has to do with a tendency to rewrite some of the key concepts and terms of those other systems of thought into architecture's code, into architecture's discursive language, such as reification, ideology, signify, signify, deconstruction, rhizome, uh, you name it. So this tendency is about importing paradigms uh, from these other systems, yeah? So it is about importing external paradigms. Now, uh, the second has to do with the object becoming more and more, um, not so much an end, but actually a medium through which to discuss aspects and concerns in other spheres of knowledge, such as politics, aesthetics, sociology, institutional analysis, religion, ethics, and so on and so forth. Now, this is meant as a diagnosis, actually, not as a criticism. And actually, I think it's fair to say that it is largely due to those two um, uh, discursive dynamics that we have experienced a major growth in the sphere of history, theory, and criticism when seen historically. Yeah? Now, given this scenario, however, this event proposes the following. The architectural design has become a discursive formation in its own right, and it is therefore ready to produce its own systems of thought, potentially for other uh, disciplines to import from. Yeah. So it is about the possibility in a way of reversing the arrow of knowledge. So not so much importing, but actually potentially even exporting, producing from within and exporting. 
that in order for that to happen, then the architectural object needs to go from being uh, merely a medium to actually becoming the central realm of research in its own right. Because it is that way that it could then uh, be the seat um, for producing those theoretical frameworks that could reach, that could transcend its own limit, that could transcend the limits of architecture. Now thirdly, what, what follows from the above uh, would be that actually, uh, if that were the case, then we would be in a position to claim uh, a space within the map of scholarly knowledge for design thinking, which I don't think is that obvious now, and this is one of the things that I'd like to uh, discuss um, later today. Now, in order to pursue this agenda, what we do is we take the architectural object par excellence, that is the building, and we place it at the center of the table. You know? Now, we ask of it two things. First, that through it we can generate knowledge that is directly relevant for, directly relevant to design thinking. You know? So in this sense, the ambition is to identify design techniques, design moves, uh, rearticulations of the elements of the architectural language, that are historically significant, such as in the past was the case, for example, with Loos's Home Plan, or Le Corbusier's Free Plan, or OMA's Free Section, or The Field, or The Fall, and so on and so forth. Second, the more, the more ambitious one, uh, perhaps, that through the building we can ask whether architecture could potentially have the capacity to think up systems of thought by itself, that is to say, once rooted in sets of ideas and constituencies that are specifically architectural, the same way structuralism was rooted in the study of the sign, for example, or psychoanalysis originated in the study of the human psyche, or Frankfurt School dialectics was rooted in ideology critique, and so on and so forth. We can identify many of these throughout the 20th century. Now, this is what we meant by considering the possibility of design concepts being turned into theoretical frameworks beyond the boundaries of architecture, since those frameworks could potentially be appropriated by, by other fields. Now, that's the basic argumentative setup, so to speak. And now to end on a few, uh, with a few words on format. This is a symposium that brings together historians, theorists, uh, PhD candidates, and architects in order to examine these issues from various professional interests and backgrounds, and from both Europe and the US. Now, all of them were asked to choose a building built, built or designed within the last 25 years that they could show, embody a historically significant contribution in the domain of design thinking. Now, since we want to emphasize discussion over perhaps more formal, uh, lengthy presentations, they were asked to put forward the arguments in only five to seven minutes. So that's what you will see today. Uh, lastly, participants have been grouped in three uh, roundtable discussions based on their contributions sharing some common ground and yet creating tension within it. So uh, what we'll see today uh, uh, is a first table, uh, which is loosely centered around the question of the architectural reference, which is one that's very hot today, I believe, for a number of reasons. Then there is a, a second table, which touches on the rapport between the building on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the city and the urban subject, not only as physical form, but also as a number of uh, social and, and political forces. Um, which on the contrary, it's a topic that perhaps may have lost some traction, at least in the, in the US, it's something to be discussed also, uh, potentially. And then a third table, uh, which focuses on what I anyway read as um, the reworkings of the logics governing what these days has come to be understood as the elements of architecture because of the, because of the Biennale. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jorge Trovailos, who has been kind enough to moderate the first table. So thank you again, everybody, for coming, and I hope you will enjoy the event. Thank you, Jose. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jorge Otero Bailos. I'm a professor of historic preservation here at Columbia University. I'll be moderating the first uh, panel. Uh, I'll be introducing each of the speakers individually. Um, the panel includes Stan Allen, Gab Gabriela Garcia de Cortazar, Constantis Kizis, Amanda Reeser Lawrence, Enrique Walker, Aaron White, and there will be a response from Michael Meredith. So our first speaker today is Stan Allen, a practicing architect, 
George Dutton, 27, Professor of Architecture at Princeton, where he was Dean of the School of Architecture for many years and now Acting Dean. In 2011, he was inducted into the College of Fellows of the AIA. And in 2012, he was elected to the National Academy of Design. He's won many prizes and awards, has been published and exhibited internationally. His uh, CV is dozens of pages long, so we, uh, these are just some major highlights. We are very pleased and honored to have Stan Allen here with us today. Please join me in welcoming him. All right. Uh, Thank you, Jorge, uh, Jose, and Enrique. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and um, pleasure to be able to respond to uh, Jose's and Aaron's uh, provocation. But, but even, even as I say that, I wonder why should it be a provocation that architects should talk about buildings? So that's something, that's something we can... Uh, we, we, we can talk about. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic with the thrust of the, uh, of the event. Um, but maybe it's also the natural contrarian in me that wants to say yes, but. So hence the title, Building Not Building. And I hope that will become clear over the course of the presentation. Um, does this advance? Yes. And uh, this is also a laser pointer? Perfect. OK, and I also will try and you know, not set a bad example by going past uh, my time, although I have a lot of slides. Uh, inevitably, I, I have to see this through the lens of my own uh, practice. This is the first project I ever built. So it was a gallery in Lower Manhattan, uh, finished around 19, early 1990s. Um, and I belong to the generation, first built works tended to be interiors. Uh, in other words, not building. So certainly all of the problems of building are here, detail, uh, materiality, structure even, but it's not a building. Also, the other thing is, um, with the gallery, it's, it's uh, obviously with this photograph, I'm, I'm intending that there is some uh, commonality between the work that's exhibited here and the, and the gallery space itself, but the space of the gallery is not complete until it's actually occupied by the artworks. Now, this, I, I sort of couldn't resist showing, is I got this photograph yesterday. Um, this is a very recent project. Um, it looks like a building. I'm not sure it's a building, though. Uh, for one thing, it's two buildings. Uh, it's actually an addition. Uh, this in the back was one of the first houses I built about 10 years ago. And this is the recently completed portion, which is, which is an addition and a reworking of the original project. So it takes the sort of singularity of, the, of that house and, and opens it up to some sort of larger field-like organization. So I thought this might be worthwhile trying to kind of map out very sort of tentatively. So, so there's an axis here which has to do with drawing versus building, the drawn versus the constructed, uh, the realm of the project on the left, the realm of the, the building on the right. But then I thought it was also important to signal that there, there exists a large category of things that are built that uh, in, invoke all of the problematics of the discipline and the architect's expertise, but they're not necessarily buildings. So landscapes, infrastructures, interiors probably should have been over here. Uh, the problem of the pavilion, which I, 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 I imagine will come up, uh, the temporary construction. Uh, so, so really with this diagram, I want to suggest two things. One, one is that there, there, it's possible to open up the, this realm of the building and that by saying that you're in favor of the building, doesn't mean you're in favor of a sort of single, singular definitive notion of the building. Um, and, and even, I, I think, with the axis between the, the drawn and the constructed, I also wanted, I think it's important to, let's say, signal the difference between somebody like Haydick. Everything Haydick drew could be built. It, Liebeskin's early projects, for example, or the paper architecture in the Soviet Union in the 70s, uh, were, were actually not buildable. And I think that's an important distinction to make uh, as well. But to say that you're in favor of the building is not necessarily to say in a kind of definitive way that you're in favor of the real over the virtual. And in fact, I would argue that the best buildings are those which open up the, the realm of the built to something of the uncertainty uh, and the instability of the, of, of the virtual. And there's a kind of corollary of that, I would suggest, as well. I mean. I mean, Liebeskin, of course, does buildings now, but many of his buildings are simply the translation of a drawing 
and nothing is sort of added to it in the, in the process of building. Um, now, of course, the other thing is this has to be seen in the context of the theoretical work I'm, I'm most strongly associated with. That is the notion of the field. Uh, that's the Swedish translation of the essay from object to field. Um, and I think that, that's been wrongly interpreted, I think, in some senses to say it's about the dissolution of the building into some sort of distributed ephemeral field. Um, I would suggest instead it's about field-like organizations um, su suggested on the left and strategies of aggregation which can certainly be brought back to the realm of building, the, the, the Venice Hospital below and Melnikov Sukharov Market uh, above. So as I was putting together the, the, the slides, I came across this image, which was the title of a recent lecture, which could be the subtitle for this lecture, From Object to Field and Back. So I, I also have to confess, I, I actually read Jose's brief like three days ago. And I said, oh, I'm supposed to show one building. Um, and it was, so I don't want to claim that this building is the most significant building built in the last 25 years. I'm, that's a little suspicious of that. It's a building which, very important to me, it, it's, a, it's a building by architects of my generation with whom I'm, I'm quite close and, and share certain backgrounds. So uh, it, it, I, I thought this, this was a building I had to talk about in this particular context. And also a building that I think engages the problematic of the, of the field and the tension between field-like organizations and some sort of definitive resolution in uh, construction. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's uh, Mansiu Tunyon's uh, Muzak, uh, finished in, in uh, 2004 in Leon, Spain. Um, and uh, of course, it's very, uh, well, it, it is a field-like mat organization, a building which opens up the singularity of the building to some sort of mul multiplicity and uh, creates a very strong relationship to the city. Um, it's, of course, most often photographed and known for these very powerful polychromatic uh, facades, uh, which provoke uh, photographs like this. I think, again, this is one of the properties of building, is that it can trigger all kinds of responses and effects that are sort of, sort of unanticipated in the original building. I, I believe that's the back of Emilio's head. I may be wrong. Uh, but I also want to get away, away from simply the, 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 uh, this, the, the, the most photogenic part of the building. Um, and also, before visiting the building, I, I was convinced that it was a kind of anti-contextual uh, move. Uh, but in fact, um, the, the relationship between the context and this irregular profile is, is, is actually seems to me very deliberate and uh, really quite powerful. Um, now, it is a field-like organization, and again, there's something I think that's, that's very much worth calling attention to. Um, if th this is a pr diagram of the, of the programmatic sequence of the galleries, uh, this is a diagram of the geometric organization, but it's not ac actually obvious, sorry, how you get from this to the actual plan of the building. Uh, the figure, ultimately, that's defined by the galleries is actually that, so um, there's a very subtle and nuanced geometric transformation of the diagram into the form of building. Um, now, uh, we, because of Mancia Tunyon's association with Moneo, and of course we, point of reference in this discussion would have to be Moneo's uh, essay, The Solitude of, of the Building. Um, we tend to think of Mancia Tunyon in, in, in that legacy. And certainly this early project of theirs, the Museum in Zamora, would, would seem to, to uh, confirm that. It's a solid, closed box. I think there were actually good contextual reasons for that, um, but their more recent work has opened up to these uh, more playful, field-like organizations, which of course I'm very sympathetic with, uh, and um, I believe that, that Muzak is a, kind of, is a kind of transition point in their career between the kind of closed figure of Zamora and these more recent uh, field-like or organizations. As I said, there's, a, there's quite a subtle transformation from the diagram to the built form, um, and it, I think it, it, it reflects their, in a sense, their sort of confidence with the realm of, uh, of, of building as it gets translated up uh, through this, this form here. Um, 
These are the gallery spaces where you, you sense this field-like geometry that both defines individual galleries but then opens up into a larger whole. Um, it's, um, again, symposium and building. We ought to be looking at detail and construction. Um, one of the things that's interesting is this is a concrete building. Uh, it, has a, it has a steel and glass curtain wall, uh, and you see it, it's a kind of inversion where you have the concrete on the interior, actually, and you have the sheathing and the layered facade on the, on the exterior. So, so that's a reinforced concrete wall, and what you see on the outside is actually a, actually a rain screen. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's uh, as you move up, and these are the large kind of skylights that are shown on the, on the drawing on the right there. Um, now, I, I think it's, it's interesting, and, and perhaps this uh, keys into uh, Jose's comments about architecture um, in some kind of dialogue with, with other fields. Um, it's worthwhile looking at the function of the museum and the way artists have responded to it. This is a very open, um, gallery for, for a performance piece. This is Hugo Rondinet, you could say very, sort of filling the, ob, the, the gallery conventionally with, with objects. This is Pipilotti Riest. Uh, I think she's responding to this. Um, oh, it may simply have been the photographer. Um, this, by the way, the, the skylight in the lobby. Um, the, the building is board form concrete, uh, and then the lobby is, is sheathed in wood. So. You, you couldn't obviously do that in concrete. So you, you have this very interesting moment where the, the, the texture of the boards and the texture of the boards form concrete sort of blur against one another and um, kind of destabilize your sense of the materiality of the building. Th this would be for me a moment where I, again, I would argue the, the realm of the virtual is destabilizing the, 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 the solidity of the, of the structure. Uh, this Hugo Rondinet as well. Um, and I, I, I don't usually like to do this in, in formal presentations, but I'll just read a little bit. This is Augustine Perez Rubio, the curator at, at uh, Muzak, in, in discussion with uh, Giancarlo Valle, talking about the museum, uh, responding to a question about the, the plan projecting an era of incompleteness. And, and the curator says, first off, the building is such a strong statement, it is almost an art piece. More importantly, there's the idea of the building as part of the city, the way it regenerates the urban landscape. The institution is social space, very important to the city. When Siu Chunyon arrived at a single design, we saw, it, we saw it as multiple in the sense that we were able to add to it. Right after the museum won the Mies van der Rohe Prize, a question arose, at what moment should we consider a building complete and thus sufficient to receive one of architecture's highest honors? We must consider the museum is not, the museum is not only architecture and therefore cannot be considered complete. We have to understand Muzak's role as a space of use and reuse concept that Mancio and Tonion embrace, which is to say that the artist's work is equally part of the museum. So I think here, here's an example of, of, a, of a curator understanding the, the, the potential and the possibility of the kind of open field-like organization of the building and kind of embracing it. Uh, yet another example of an artist intervening in the building, taking the panels off the side and, and reinstalling them inside, and then this interesting instance where Sana's work is inside of the so uh, here's the dialogue between two different architects. So, um, so and then this example, um, you may know the colors of the facade are an abstraction of, of a stained glass window in the cathedral in Leon, and then here you have a performance piece where those were now projected back onto the, so literally the building is being projected back into the, into the city. Uh, again, these are the kinds of responses certainly not anticipated in the design, but the kinds of things that the building provokes as an object in the world. So I'm simply going to close by running a very fast sort of animation of a building that I did shortly after, uh, which, which is, is, is in many ways a kind of response to that. I, I wrote down this quote. This is one of the first sketches I made for the, the gallery in Maribor. This was a phrase that Luis and Emilio had used in, a, in an interview where they were talking about Muzak as, an, as non, a non-centralized expansive system be capable of becoming specific at each point. Uh, so a grid is a non-centralized expansive system, but a grid is the same at every point. So it's a pretty good definition of field conditions um, and certainly one that I was embracing here. And uh, so again, I'm not sure if this is a building or maybe it's 15 buildings. Uh, 
And it's that sense of multiplicity which in turn engenders uh, a sense of incompleteness that I was after in this project uh, and could certainly be seen as a kind of dialogue uh, with the Mencia Tunyon project, um, both in its embrace of multiplicity and uh, let's say finished incompleteness and uh, uh, as well in its uh, relationship to context uh, and what it could potentially contribute uh, to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gabriela Garcia de Cortázar. She is an architect in Chile, currently a PhD candidate at the AA, uh, with a number of important fellowships, like the Becas Chile and the Abbey Santander UCL. Please welcome Gabriela Garcia de Cortázar. Uh, hi all, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a house, uh, Casa Wolf, uh, built in 2007, and it's by Peso von Ehrlichhausen Architects. Um, so I'll start. The Wolf House is yet another minimal house. Uh, it is, its streamlined metallic exterior shines among, among dull looking suburban houses an orthogonal vertical element in between pitch roofed houses. When seen in plan, uh, the house has a coffin shape, uh, a fact that produces uh, six facades. The wolf house, however, is built with four walls, two of which are conventional 20 centimeter thick walls, the ones you see uh, below and on top. Um, while the other two are unconventional, obtuse, triangle-shaped uh, ones. These last two walls, thanks to their thickening, have been carved out in order to house staircases, storage space, bathrooms, shafts, and windows. All the elements destined to give the support for life have been located inside these walls, an operation, an operation which, in turn, liberates the central space for life itself. The rationale behind these operations, however, cannot be found in the discourse of the architectural practice, uh, as it quite determinately stays on the surface of things. Their production, on the other hand, is an unremarkable series of provincial houses with only but a few core ideas that seem to repeat over and over. The thick facade is not one of these recurrent ideas, though, but seems to be a one-off scheme. Despite its muteness, this house introduces several tensions between elements and or principles of architecture that go far beyond the reach of its suburban site. First of all, how should we call this? Walls or facades? Uh, if a facade par excellence is the Palazzo Ruccellais or Santa Maria Novelas for, to this effect, this is a layer as thin as, thin as a tapestry, to quote Semper, but loaded with meaning and that is different from a wall, then these are just too thick to be facades. Yet they sit on the perimeter of the building and occupy their space. In this sense, these walls as facades have more to do with pre-modern construction, uh, such as medieval keeps, where outer walls housed uh, staircases, arrow loops, and whole rooms in the thickness of their walls. Than, uh, than with, this, with these architectural distinctions, uh, such as Semper's. Uh, these walls are also tackling a very modernist problem, the classic, even cliche, differentiation between served and serving spaces. The house is organized in such a manner that there is a very clear distinction between the two, with an evident preponderance of the first. Yet, this is done in a very non-modernist way. Instead of celebrating them, as in Philip Johnson's or Mia's glass houses, where they stand proudly in the middle, or even the high-tech Pompidou Center with its pipe pipes shining in the back. They, the services here are, are pushed into and hidden within the thickness of the walls. The closeting of the house's services makes it impossible to celebrate function, and so this tension is treated only as a domestic infrastructural problem. The thick walls as facades also challenge the still current tension between structure and form. 
the main achievement of modern construction, the independence of structure and surface, and therefore the freedom of form, is here treated in a contradictory manner. The exterior of the house appears clad in a shiny, continuous material, and windows only mean a change of material, very much like any contemporary building. The structure, however, is not independent from this surface, uh, although pretty much like a balloon frame, uh, the metallic structure is imprisoned and contained within the thickness of the walls, uh, with the exterior cladding and the interior plastering uh, making as if the whole sandwich was just one massive <coughs> wall. Uh, after all these unresolved tensions that I've mentioned, uh, it doesn't come as a surprise that uh, the brief, in the words of the architects, uh, was the design of a house for a recently divorced man. So let's talk about tensions there. Uh, this minimal statement of the problem to tackle offers, I want to argue, a glimpse of an answer to the question of how this building participates and contributes in metadisciplinary discussions. The problem at stake, at stake here uh, is the most simple and yet the most fundamental metadisciplinary problem. How should life be? For tackling this, the architects who look at the problem in plan see only walls and the subsequent problems that these bring with them, as we have seen with the unresolved disciplinary tensions lying within the wall of houses, thick walls. The occupant, on the contrary, lives his life in space happily, we hope, uh, his experience being contained by the house's surfaces in total ignorance of what lies beyond. So maybe this is what experts could call uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, or maybe it would be the other way around. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kostandis Kizis. He is a Greek architect, partner uh, and principal of Kizis Architects, and a PhD candidate at the Architectural Association in London. Hello. Jose, thank you for all this. Oh, it's here. Good. Um, so the Musasino Art University Library was completed in 2010. Its plan is a spiral, one continuous wall of bookshelves developed centrifugally towards the borders of the plot. These walls, bookshelves, are perforated by large openings that allow for free circulation, and between them one finds the reading rooms and the rest of the library's program. Fujimoto based his design on the idea of the physical presence of the books and the classification of them. This, of course, is not something new. One cannot help but thinking about the uh, Mundaneum, Le Corbusier's early projects in collaboration with Paul Otlet. Otlet, librarian, uh, had the dream of creating a museum where all the knowledge of the world would be classified and organized. For him, the museum was a perfectly classified library, ready to host it in its expanding grid all the production of knowledge. His collaboration with Le Corbusier gave birth to the Musée Mondial which, with the ever-expanding level pyramid, which some years later evolved to the spiral of the Museum of Unlimited Growth. Now, moving to the time frame of the last 25 years, one thinks of a series of library projects developed in the Netherlands where the physical problems, problem of the book storage and accessibility becomes central for the design. For instance, in the Delft University Library by Maikanu, the books are hosted in a large multi-story book wall, resembling to big li library stacks like uh, the one that we have here in the Asian Studies Library. Um, MVRDV designed the Spikenese Library as a mountain of books, another spiral, a pyramid of books, celebrating the bulk of printed stuff that a library may accumulate. And of course, in the Seattle Library by OMA, where a redefinition of the library as an institution is attempted, uh, I will just refer here to the part of the program that is related to the physical space of the books, uh, one of the five stable programmatic pods of the building. This is a spiral, and uh, a book spiral, or in um, Rem Kolha's words, a continuous ramp of shelving forming a coexistence between, between categories that approaches the organic. It evolves relative to the others, occupying more or less space on the spiral." End of quote. 
Uh, this, of course, uh, was one of the ideas that were contained in term in uh, um, the proposal for the French National Library by OMA, which, as we know, was win and built by Perot, uh, with its four towers both symbolically and literally raising the books above the city of Paris. So with this very brief uh, overview of recent libraries of different sizes and scales, I want to show that uh, Fujimoto's library belongs to a modern genealogy where the classification of books and their physical impact uh, seek to be expressed architecturally through the production of uh, typological alternatives. Yet, it is not only the functional issues that have triggered the typolo typological variety of libraries. The fascination with the labyrinthine spiral and the volume of the books is also about the symbolic presence of the library and the aesthetic impact that the accumulation of books may have. Fujimoto addressed this fascination uh, with an exodisciplinary reference, the imaginary world that Borges describes in the Library of Babel in his labyrinths. Borges reads, the universe, which others call the library, is composed of an indefinite number of hexagonal galleries with vast terraces between, surrounded by very long railings. From any of the hexagons, one can see, interminably, the upper and lower floors. The distribution of the galleries is invariable. Twenty cells, five long cells per side, cover all the sides except two. Their height, which is the distance from floor to the ceiling, scarcely exceeds that of uh, a normal bookcase, and he goes on. The mythical world of uh, the Argentinian novelist acted as a stimulator for, simulator for Fujimoto's ideas of the infinite, uh, infinite scheme and the effect of the eternal bookcases. This is achieved both in length by the uh, expanding grid and in height, as the space of the bookshelves is extended upwards to unreachable heights. One could argue that such translations flatten the meaning that the author wanted to convey, and that they are so literal that they might become nonsensical. Even if so, one cannot deny that there's still a stimulus for a, an architectural concept. Yet again, there is space for further conceptualization. The Musasino Library had also to fit in the architect's personal agenda. It is here where the bookshelves, uh, the bookshelf as a single element, gains a significant role. It builds the walls of the library. The bookshelf as a singular repeated element escapes the function of storage and is extended, is extended as a building material, as a brick, to places where books will never be placed, such as the upper part of the walls and the exterior of the library. This is not only a signification of the library building as a bookcase. We need here to remember that um, in Latin language is the word for the library's uh, biblioteca uh, from Greek bibliotheki, the case for books or the bookcase. The elemental use of the bookshelf ties the project together with a family of projects by Fujimoto, such as his primitive future house of 2001, where the repeated element of the thin slab at every 35 centimeters builds his nest-like house. Or his uh, house now, where the hovering slabs enable jumps from tree to tree. And of course, his wooden house of 2008, where the stacked up logs formulate then the inhabitable hollow of a wooden cube. So a library, a problem related to the arrangement, of, uh, the arrangement and classification of books that keeps producing architectural typologies. Then, a building that makes use of exodisciplinary reference, uh, in this case of the Library of Babel, in order to raise an argument about its spatial attributes. And lastly, a building that nurtures the interdisciplinary discussion by celebrating the use of a singular element, which is one of Fujimoto's uh, recent contributions in um, architectural thought. Is there space for more? Fujimoto's library, before even completing five years of life, is already an loaded object with typological, poetic, and conceptual significance. Can such a paradigm produce metadisciplinary thought? Or are we dealing here with an exhausted object that a priori relies uh, on all that has already been written, drawn, and built? So before opening up the discussion, uh, just to try to get more out of the Musasino Art Library, one has to keep in uh, mind what Fujimoto himself said about the library in striking simplicity. The library is a place where books are and people read. Thank you.
Right. Our next speaker is Amanda Reeser Lawrence, Professor of Architecture at Northeastern University. Uh, she is the author of James Sterling, Revi uh, Revisionary Modernist of 2013, editor of Praxis, and recently Deputy Commissioner of the Architecture Biennale in Venice. I should say right away that I was not Deputy Commissioner of the Biennale in Venice. Those are very contested grounds. I edited the catalog for the Biennale as part of the Praxis team. So uh, thank you, Jose. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I'm delighted to be here. I, I want to return. I actually thought I was going to be going last, so I was all prepared for my kind of concluding uh, statements on this first panel. But this traditional cleanup spot in the batting order is a good one, too. But I want to actually come back to some of the provocations that Stan made, I think, in terms of the notion of the building as multiple. And my talk talks about the notion of the multiple as through the lens of kind of a questioning of origin or originality. I think it also, um, the reference to the hot topic of the referent is something that I'm going to be addressing here as well. And in particular, I want to start with just some questions about how do we understand through this lens of building, how do we talk about the act of architectural citation within contemporary culture? What are the distinctions between imitation, illusion, reference, and suggestion, plagiarism, and quotation? And I think Jose is right that these are hot topics. I think there's a surge of interest both in architectural projects from discussions of Chinese duplitecture and Zaha ripoffs to FATS Museum of Copying at the 2012 Biennale, along with many others, as well as a, a kind of wave of academic conferences, some of which I've participated in, and journal themes on ideas like quote and replica and uh, derivatives and Jorge's new on, on the uh, copyright, I think we would put there too. So I think despite all of this, or maybe perhaps um, as a way to enter into this conversation, I just want to propose there's not, there is no theoretical framework through which to measure precisely how architecture understands its relation to, its, to itself. And I think that's where this interest comes from. And I think this, this topic is particularly perplexing and compelling when we consider the constructed artifact of the building itself, as is our task today, which is always a mediated and translated outcome, always emergent from other representational forms, as well as indebted to and implicated within a longer disciplinary history. In other words, to some degree, every building is already a copy of the drawing that foresaw it, as well as parts or holes of one or many other buildings that preceded it. So this very brief talk examines building as both a physical artifact, but as well as an act of accumulation and reference by looking at one example of an architectural copy. Architects dedicate considerable effort to achieving novelty, or at least proclaiming it. So why does, what does it mean to take seriously a building that is unapologetically, and in this case, necessarily a copy? Um, when the architectural team of, of Todd Williams and Billy Sien won the international competition, I shouldn't say I was actually invited, but the competition to design a new building for the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia, a primary requirement of the commission was to replicate the original Paul Philip Crett building, which we see here, which was in the Philadelphia suburb of Marion, in which the collection had been housed since 1925. After a well-documented, very acrimonious, and to some degree still ongoing, litigious fight concerning the original will of the founder, Albert Alfred C. Barnes, who had mandated that the collection remain displayed in his property in Marion, a judge had ruled that the collection could be moved to the more accessible location on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway in Philadelphia, just under five miles away, but that the rooms of the collection must be recreated exactly as they had existed in the original. Hmm. Barnes' unparalleled collection of post-impressionist and early modern art 180 Renoirs, 69 Cezanne, 7 Van Goghs, 46 Picassos, had been arranged in the original Marian location according to his specifications alongside an equally unparalleled collection of primitive art, everyday objects, doorknobs, andirons, furniture, folk classical art as well. Barnes referred to these precise arrangements as ensembles. The William Cien replica then is not actually of the original Cret building per se, but of a structure to house these ensembles. So the replica emerges as a byproduct of the necessity to accommodate these arrangements, 
The architecture then is a, is a kind of resultant. Etymology tells us that a reply, that replication is a reply to an original. Unlike forgery, a replica does not imply illicit or illegal activity, but rather suggests that which is sanctioned. Traditionally, replicas were made actually by the original artist, another version of something one has already done, and therefore alighting any issues of authorship. And while the impropriety with the forgery may be the degree of sameness with the replica, it's the opposite. To violate the terms of the replica is to introduce difference. Most of the press coverage of the building, and here we see the William Sien recreated gallery, takes for granted this act of replication and the ease of reproduction, just one typical Quote from the New York Times, the original Barnes has essentially been recreated in the new space. All 23 rooms are intact with artworks hung within a 16th of an inch to where they were in the old house, end quote. But of course, the building is not the same, nor was replication easy. To begin with, the gallery block itself is only one part of a larger project, which includes classroom space, cafe, etc. From the outset, the gallery block, this is an early sketch from Williams and Sand where we see that gallery block as the black piece, was conceptualized by the architects as an object maintained and then surrounded by these new programs. But even if we just look at that black box of the gallery itself, we find that it was also redefined and modified in very specific terms. Uh, the Williams and Sand recreate the layout and arrangement of the gallery spaces but they actually split the original open at what they determined, to, what they defined as these fault lines in the original design. Both in plan, we see the, the lines in the plan at the top, and then originally the idea was actually to split the building in section as well, although for budget reasons that was never carried out. Nevertheless, they pull apart that building, that quote, original, and insert there we see an early study model. Uh, I think this was actually the presentation model to the board, where we see that green space inserted in those, along those fault lines in the building, the rest of it, the, the new pieces are at this point kind of abstractly shown in the back in white. This also furthered their initial kind of conception, which was they were flipping the notion of the gallery which had existed in this garden space in its suburban location in Marion. Now they were, have, the garden was now inside of the gallery itself. So within the terms of the gallery itself, I think the, we see the original Marion Gallery above, and then we see the Philadelphia version by Williams and Sien below. The terms of replication, I think, are most clear. And indeed, the spaces are seemingly the same, driven by these assemblages and their position on the walls of the galleries of the original building. The galleries in the Philadelphia building are reproduced the same scale, the same dimension as their Marion <laughs> counterpart. But, and this is what I want to really focus on, that sameness is achieved through multiple differences. Williams and Sien talk about simplifying and intensifying in a number of instances. Uh, we were talking about molding earlier. We don't usually talk about moldings in conferences. So, but the, the molding was actually a, a focus of a lot of investigation, and particularly the crown molding in the Crete building, which they originally had thought to eliminate, but then talked about it would be like shaving your eyebrows off. And so they spent a lot of work reintroducing molding uh, in a, a intensified but simplified form. They substitute burlap walls for the original jute. They, have, they insert a new wood border. It's actually reclaimed wood from the original Coney Island boardwalk, which is inserted around the edges in a number of places. On the upper floors, which I'm not showing here, they insert clear story lighting, which actually was something that Cret had expressly forbade because he believed the gallery should have natural light like in an artist studio coming in from the windows, not from above. And in some cases, they actually moved the paintings. Um, notably, there was a Matisse that was in a um, stairway that they felt needed a more prominent place, so they made it its own room. Many of the differences within sameness here are rationalized through performance criteria, better lighting, performance, et cetera. In some cases, however, it was actually the differences emerged out of investigative work that challenged the originality of the original. One example during the design for us, the architects found that some of the heating vents, which they were hoping not to have to include, had actually not been in the original drawings that they'd been installed in a 96 renovation. And so by the terms of the replication, they did not need to appear then in their Philadelphia building. So the Williams and Sien's replica is not completely faithful. It is willfully disobedient. But what I really want to argue here is that it actually exceeds the original. In the case of the missing heating vents, it returns to a potentially earlier original. It's more barns than the barns. In their discussion of 
paintings and facsimiles, Bruno Latour and Adam Lowe, discuss how an aura can migrate through techniques of artistic reproduction. They argue that rather than diminishing the original, reproductions actually extend what they term the catchment area of a work of art, arguing for its continued validity and that, in fact, that originals need copies to survive. A copy of a painting done well, and this is critical for them, maybe we can talk about this, the, the, the cop, the, how good a copy is, is, is an important aspect for them, but the idea that that adds original, originality to the original. I would say similarly, the new Barnes creates an argument for the continued validity of the original. It's another moment in the trajectory of this work of art. Uh, Billy Sian said that it's replication. She talked about it as a scary word. It came up a lot in conversation around the building. They didn't want to replicate. Sian's fear of replication, I think, can be situated within the disciplinary necessity for novelty and originality and the anxiety around the double. And yet, at Barnes, the reluctant yet resistant and productive replication is the most compelling aspect of the project. Certainly more compelling, I would say, than the banality of the desire for the new, as evidenced in the exterior massing of the building and some of these new programmatic pieces. So Kret's original Barnes remains in situ in Marion. It's now vacated of its collection, preserved not in spite of, but because of the William Sien replication. Their labored replication brings into focus the contours of the first. It brings the art to a public for whom it was previously very difficult to access. And in this way, I think it adds originality to this reference and also reconfigures both. This is really this relationship is what I want to focus on. So as, as a concluding remark, I think a considered study of sameness in architecture offers new ways to reconsider the long discredited notion of originality or perhaps maybe contested. An original, as Latour and Lowe point out, needs copies to survive. The act of replication, if understood as a deliberate and difficult act, deserves assessment. The replica questions and clarifies through its reproduction. It allows us to see the originality of the original while also adding to that originality. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron White, a PhD student here at uh, GSAPP. Uh, whose research focuses on 19th and 20th century American architecture. He's taught at Pratt and the New School, and his articles have been published in journals such as AD, Clog, Studio, Urban Omnibus, and ThinkSpace pamphlets. Okay. So I'm going to talk today about uh, Alfred Lerner Hall, uh, designed by Bernard Schumi Architects, uh, completed in 1999. And I think a lot of the themes we've already heard about today are going to be continued. I, um, I'm starting to think I've been unconsciously perhaps channeling some of the earlier talks, but uh, so it should be interesting. Okay. Uh, upon its completion in 1999, Alfred Lerner Hall was accused by more than one architectural critic of being a confused and what may be worse, a conflicted building. It was described as, quote, clashing in material and style, trapped in a dialectic between campus and city, and even uh, lacking confidence in its own character. In essence, I don't disagree with any of these assessments, and all I really hope to do today is to describe them with a, pre with a precision these commentators generally avoided. Uh, I think Lerner Hall is an anxious building. It's anxious about its context, about the influence that context asserts, and about the pleasure it obviously takes in allowing that influence to assert itself. Perhaps what has puzzled its critics more than anything is that it adopts rather than denies these anxieties, but this I hope to show also allows it to operate upon them. Where many have seen subservience to precedent, I think we find a surprising degree of agency, and in the end I think one finds that it is not only the building that is anxious about its context, but the context that becomes anxious in this building. In the most general sense, context arrives at Lerner Hall in the form of the 1894 campus plan. Uh, from, the, from the beginning, Lerner Hall was in violation of this plan in as, much, in as much as it conjoined into one building site what Charles McKim had planned as two separate buildings. Right, so we're down here. Here's the site, two separate buildings. Uh, in proposing a single building, Columbia's trustees seem to have been willing to sacrifice this aspect of McKim's plan. 
From the earliest sketches, however, Lerner Hall is expressed not as the single building it in fact is, but rather as three distinct masses, two of which inhabit the footprints of McKim's plan, while the other fills the courtyard between them. Here then, Shumi is more contextual than the contextuals. Uh, he adopts the McKim sites, the McKim blocks, as he often calls them, uh, but only to transform them in both appearance and performance. On the interior, Shumi links McKim's buildings, making them perform as one by means of a continuously shared floor surface, while on the exterior, he constructs the void between them as a glass vitrine which simultaneously separates and connects the blocks. We might read the end result as one building becoming three or three buildings becoming one, but in either case, we're left with, e with something either more or less than McKim had in mind. This simultaneous adoption and, dis and disturbance occurs not only between masses, but within them as well. For instance, by virtue of its position in McKim's plan, Lerner Hall is a wide building. By virtue of its design, however, it plays the role of a narrow one as well, an ambiguity that not only affects our reading of Lerner Hall, but alters the way we read McKim's composition in turn. For instance, well, let me go back here. Uh, what, I, what I mean by that is just, you know, uh, narrow, wide, wide, narrow, narrow, wide, wide, narrow. So you get this kind of rhythm that McKim sets up uh, that uh, Shumi is both adopting and disturbing. So moving forward. Uh, for instance, uh, if we read Lerner Hall as a wide building, then McKim's A, B, B, A rhythm is retained, right? That's this up here. Uh, however, if we read it as a narrow building, then a shortened ABA rhythm centered on Fernald Hall uh, emerges. And finally, if we read Lerner Hall's narrow facade as the mirror image of Fernald Hall's narrow projection, we can even read a composition centered around the entrance at 115th Street. If we follow the glazing, uh, the glazing that defines the narrow from the wide, uh, inside the building, we see how this narrow interval helps organize the interior, how it aligns with the major ramp, right? So here's the this is that major ramp that goes up. Here's the kind of other ramp that moves along the campus side. Uh, and there's a kind of alignment between that glass, uh, per, that, that uh, depression in the facade and the, and the ramp. Uh, so if we follow the glazing inside the building, we see how this narrow interval helps organize the interior, how it aligns with the major ramp, and thus as one ascends the ramp, frames views of the city not unlike those McKim provided elsewhere on campus. And I, th some of those are indicated here. In addition to distributing buildings on the site, McKim's plan devised a language and even a hierarchy of materials based on the campus's first two buildings, Low Library and the Macy Villa, today called Buell Hall. So uh, Low Library, this was the Macy Villa before it was moved. And of course, if you add this to this, uh, somehow you kind of get this. You, uh, these are the kind of hybridizations of a, a connection between the, the original two buildings. Um, low Library stone was the noble material. Macy's Villa's, Macy Villa's brick, the humble one. In the pavilions, therefore, stone defined the coins, columns, keystones, pilasters, and porticos of McKim's uh, Beaux-Arts classicism, while brick was relegated to an infill thought to represent, quote, a reversion to the best construction of the colonial period. For McKim, then, stone and brick were not just materials, but a distinction, but a, but a distinction between high and low, between a past the university wished to acknowledge as past and a future it aspired to. Shumi adopts these materials, but of course the distinction they bore for McKim is absolutely untenable for him. And so with that distinction go the coins, columns, and keystones thought to bear it. In Lerner Hall, stone loses its articulation and enters into the logic of infill formerly held by brick alone. Thus relieved of the division of labor between them, one might imagine new forms of interaction would have become possible. But in comparison, it, it seems to be McKim rather than Shumi who we find willing to compose and recompose both within and between the various buildings he designed. McKim's stone and brick were unequal but interactive. Shumi's are equal but segregated. We're therefore not surprised to find that whereas McKim composes at a range of scales from window to portico to projection to pavilion, Shumi composes at the scale of the building as, the, as a whole. His facade stacks one material upon another as if, the as, a, as if the juxtaposition between his glass vitrine and the McKim blocks was here read into stone and brick themselves. Shumi's material operations also produce an inversion of McKim's hierarchy, whose most poignant example is the enigmatic column fronting the campus elevation. 
Here, brick replaces stone while, retaining, uh, while it retains the column's privileged status and even exaggerates it. Shumi's column thus becomes a trophy, held rather than holding. It's kind of, it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually touch the, sorry, it doesn't actually touch the top or bottom. Uh, it's kind of held inside there. Uh, so held rather than holding, brick at its most rarefied and most, insu and most insubstantial, offered in pantomime and parody of the colonnades fronting low in Butler libraries. In conclusion, I want to make two points related to two of those seemingly tangential discoveries one makes while conducting research, but that have come to take on a more, uh, a more than tangential significance for me. The first is that uh, as late as Lerner Hall's bid set, uh, so for any non-architects, uh, very, very late in the process. Uh, so as late as Lerner Hall's bid set, we still find a stacked bond brick pattern in place of the Flemish bond pattern one finds throughout the rest of campus. Yeah, so here's, here's your stacked bond, Flemish bond. Uh, and, would, and that would appear uh, on Lerner, eventually on Lerner Hall itself. In the end, Flemish bond was manda mandated for reasons of contextual similarity, but that it was mandated at such a late date seems to suggest Lerner Hall may have had a hand in defining what only became contextual a posteriori. This suggests a different temporality and perhaps even a different causality when it comes to context. It suggests context may be less given than composed, uh, in the Latour sense of the word, uh, even composed, um, uh, uh, or that it may even be created in the same way that Borges argued Kafka created his precursors. The second, statement, the second uh, discovery is a statement concerning Lerner Hall's design, which reads as follows. Uh, quote, the enclosed court, also known as the ramps or the hub, is the literal and metaphorical heart of the building. Successfully protected by the architect and the client from the forces of pragmatism, it remains virtually unchanged from the schematic design phase. A sketch, or rather a series of sketches, uh, confirms this statement. So this series of sketches. Uh, as late as January 1996, we find Shumi designing and redesigning his McKim blocks, producing a grid of alternatives with but one commonality between them. The so-called ramps or hub, here saved, from, here saved from the forces of pragmatism and apparently from the forces of design as well. Here I think we have two models of agency. The McKim blocks make Shumi anxious, and so he gets his hands on them, composing and recomposing. The ramps don't make him anxious in the same way, and therefore they're untouchable in a sense. One model anxiously operates in the interstices of a context that thereby gains a hand in creating. The other confidently, heroically even, stands alongside this context, but in standing alongside, finds little reason to change. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Enrique Walker. He is an architect and professor here at uh, GSAPP, where he's also director of the Masters of Science in Advanced Architectural Design. He is the author of Chumi on Architecture, Conversations with Enrique Walker, uh, published by Monticelli in 2006, and also uh, the author of important articles through which he's worked out his theory of architecture that have been published in various places but bear the titles normally of a single word like scaffoldings, compendium, erratum, and sometimes two words like under constraint. Thank you, Jorge. Thanks, Jose, also, and Aaron for the invitation. So the, the, the project I'd like to talk about, um, and I must say uh, that I, this is part of a conversation with the authors, is uh, a house by um, office, uh, Kirsten Gers, David van Severen, uh, Brussels-based uh, uh, office. Um, and the house is called uh, Villa Shore, although they usually tend to avoid names of clients in their publication, so they refer to a um, city villa. Um, but in fact, they colloquially refer to the building as the house under the house. It's a project that was designed between 2000 and, designed and built between 2009 and 2012. So it's a really t relatively recent um, um, project. Uh, and as I said, this is what I, I present as part of a conversation that I've been having with uh, both of them over the course of the past uh, few years. So f first, I'll present uh, the project in brief. Um, 
the protocol for the extension of, a, of an existing house, the house you see there, uh, which by virtue of topographical conditions um, implied that the house was a floor basically above the level of the street. So uh, they decided to basically add a full plinth to the house. That implied in turn splitting the program, in turn implied first to restoring the original house and then splitting the program of the house into two halves, um, the place for basically sleeping above and the place for living, uh, so-called uh, living um, uh, underneath. So it became basically a house uh, under um, a house. So I'd like to make um, three points about uh, the project uh, in, in sequence, and I hope I can have keep within uh, the time. So um, the house, in fact, it is uh, two uh, conditions. The one above restored, the one underneath, that at some points is basically announced in the fissures between the two systems. But in fact, what they produce, as they argued, is a sort of uh, whole universe underneath uh, the existing house. So the first point is a point I made on their work uh, before this house. Um, I, I, have, I wrote a piece on their, um, on their work with a single word uh, title. Um, and uh, it was basically uh, on the occasion of an exhibition they, uh, they were hosting at uh, The Single in Antwerp. Um, a number of their projects uh, and the exhibition was called Seven Rooms. Uh, and the argument I made uh, very, very briefly was that basically all the projects that they were designing at the time implied uh, defining a room or basically a square somewhere, usually around or within a building, existing building. Um, and uh, it, it was usually one room or a number of rooms that in turn uh, were applied on either uh, a very tight ex set of, kind of existing site circumstances, those projects that were commissioned, as young architects would receive very, very um, difficult conditions when starting uh, to design for. And the second set of projects were those projects that they were actually designing against the paper, which were more provocations and polemics. Uh, the, the former, of course, was of my interest since they implied the negotiation of trying to fit uh, a room within an existing place and in fact solving the space uh, around it. And I think there's something about what Gabriela presented uh, in, in their work, uh, the poche between one and the other. The second set of projects, the ones against the paper, I, I think I ignored uh, from the paper. And in fact, I, I focused on the tight negotiation of constraints between one um, and the other. So um, the, the Villa Shore is in fact one of those uh, corrections. Um, and in fact, when we continue the conversation a few years later, um, I basically discussed precisely that point, the fact that it was one of those uh, corrections which implied um, changing the nature of the house through design in such a way that whatever you designed looks almost as if it were there from before the time the house was there. In fact, they designed a plinth after the house and had to remove everything underneath. And the, the good design, in other words, is more or less met at the point where uh, it's read as if it were the original mo move rather than the, the subsequent move. So that's the house they restored. They produced an entirely new, uh, different uh, system uh, underneath. And this system underneath um, is based basically on a number of structural points, columns. In fact, they refer to uh, Mondrian's uh, painting, uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie, where they basically said that they were going to draw space with points. And in fact, I think that uh, that uh, painting is quite evocative, not only because of the, um, the dots replacing the line, um, but by and large because the dots are slightly messier uh, than the lines in the fact that this building necessarily has to compromise the order above. In other words, has to basically meet uh, the requ structural requirements that are, are derived from the building um, above. And in fact, uh, it produced, again, uh, a correction of the existing building by virtue of putting one um, underneath. So that's actually the first point. Um, as it happened, it was actually formulated before the project was designed. Uh, but um, the second point is that, in fact, uh, the house under the house is, in fact, a correction. But I think it's, uh, it's also a a specific correction where basically the found object becomes uh, more important than the correction itself. In fact, I would inscribe this project within a long-standing tradition of how the field of architecture has dealt belatedly because of technical conditions with the problem of the found object. If you go back to uh, the 90s, and I see Bernard here, um, what the, one of the discussions on basically how to displace the architectural object which was doomed to its relation to ground, in other words, you were um, you were deprived or any sort of Duchampian uh, um, approach, 
One of the techniques for basically displacing the object was that of producing a building above the building. And in fact, Le Frenois was such case, uh, but you could also see that in the 90s, the, the original scheme that Foster proposed for the Reichstag, where basically there was a gigantic roof uh, over the Reichstag, or even the project that Richard Rogers formulated for the South Bank, where he basically covered a number of buildings under one building, and in so doing basically uh, changed the nature of uh, the object. Into uh, the following decade, I would say that the most important uh, lineage in relation to the found object that affects this one is, in fact, the one started by Herzog de Miron. It's a product that I think is inscribed within a lineage of projects started by uh, Kaisha Forum, uh, and that you actually even trace back a bit into the small slit that Herzog de Miron proposes to enter uh, the turbine hall uh, at Bankside uh, uh, power station, where basically you have to go under the building in order to go inside uh, the building. Um, and in fact, that tradition is one where, where I would say this building meets, uh, but also what I would say this building, uh, um, where this building is actually making an important contribution. If you basically discuss this building in relation to that lineage, you may say that one, the building removes every single piece of structure, as opposed to certain pieces that fall in Kaisha Forum. Uh, and in addition to that, it has to exploit it programmatically in terms of how the house is organized. In other words, it's a world above, uh, rooms to sleep, and a world underneath, rooms to live in, but there are, there are by and large, uh, interchangeable. And in fact, um, the main point would be uh, precisely that one, that basically as found object, uh, it makes a contribution precisely in cutting fully the relationship to, um, to its place. And in fact, um, I'm showing the construction uh, images uh, that, funny enough, at that level uh, are more important. This is, uh, um, first and foremost, a kind of concept that, as opposed to the one of the correction, is not derived from drawing, but it's in fact derived from building. In other words, if the concept of the found object is not built, it has very little value uh, as an operation. In other, as Bernard basically used to say, it has to be a hypothesis that needs to be verified uh, in its building. And in fact, that's what the building uh, does. So that would be the second point. But the third point is that um, it will also be reductive to basically simply speak about the building as the opposition or the contradiction between the, that of the found object above and the, and the plinth of uh, columns uh, produced underneath. Um, the plinth of columns as a system that they introduce is also uh, highly contaminated in itself. And in fact, even though uh, the product is designed as an organized system, it's a product that is deeply uh, compromised. Um, as, as you basically get close to some of the columns, you realize that some of them are in fact touching the edge of the outside, and some of them are actually either inside the building or on the outside. Um, and in fact, um, the, the reference to uh, Broadway boogie woogie becomes important not only because in fact all the columns seem to be within a grid, but are uh, changing the module uh, brutally from moment to moment. In fact, what looks as order is complete illusion. But also because basically a number of the operations of the system, once they intersect materialization, they are deeply uh, distorted. So the first one that I find it's most interesting is the fact that all those columns that are on the edge of the inside-outside um, are subjected to the problem of the cold bridge, as a result of which um, they have to decide to do um, concrete columns on the inside or on the outside and steel columns clad on wood at the perimeter. The cladding of wood makes it look as if it were concrete, but it also allows for um, setting, the, 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 setting the window without having a frame and in fact uh, also changing the window. So um, you see that there's a, a huge compromise in terms of the system that uh, you would have expected um, that an architect would either um, decide to redefine the system as twofold, uh, or basically die with it technically uh, and uh, subject uh, the building to a different uh, condition. It is not a coincidence, I would say, that lately um, both, uh, both of them have been discussing intensely uh, the notion of the difficult hole. In fact, if we go back to Venturi's main contribution in his book, Complexity and Contradiction, the notion of the difficult hole is not only a sensibility that Venturi is advancing by claiming that an architectural product is by definition the convergence of constraints that will be conflicting, and that the resolution is by definition compromise and negotiation. Um, but so he's not only defining a sensibility for his work, but he's also basically advancing a definition of what architectural design implies, that basically 
the condition of optimization, which is so dear in our academic uh, setting, is one which is by definition at odds uh, with design. Design means basically compromising and negotiating conditions that are never to be basically synthesized. Um, and interestingly enough, in the work of uh, Kirsten Gers and David van Severen, I would say that uh, design insofar as drawing is basically designed as a sort of Kanyan way, uh, but at the level of materialization, uh, I think that Venturi would basically kick in and produce, in fact, uh, a slightly more compromised uh, um, negotiation. Um, coming back to the, to the question of the, um, of the, of the conference, um, if I think that the, basically how do we discuss buildings uh, in, uh, in academia, but also from uh, the, in the kind of doctoral uh, context, um, and I think I, in, I, I was one of those uh, kind of doctoral students uh, who basically wrote at the edge of the field and was at some point even advised that the idea of not mentioning the word architecture in the thesis was probably not a very good one. Um, I, would, um, I would claim that basically uh, not so much the opposition between uh, building and non-building or project and building uh, as, uh, as discussed uh, previously, but in fact as uh, those, the level of uh, ideas that derive from, uh, in fact, or, or decide decisions that derive from formulation that we usually deal with in academia, and the level of ideas that derive from resolution that we usually do not deal with so much in academia. And primarily, those ideas of formulation that come after resolution. Thank you very much. Um, we will now have a response to the speakers from Michael Meredith, who is an architect and professor uh, of architecture at Princeton School of Architecture. He's a principal of MOS, MOS Moss with Hillary Sample, uh, very recently recipients of the Wholesome Award, uh, and of course many others award many other awards coming from the AIA Architectural Record, practically every possible award out there. So, Michael. You want me to do this here? Um, okay, I, I'll try to be brief so we can sit down and talk. The, the I, I think it's good to start with the, the effects of the, to some degree. The building, I think, um, sort of produces a strange emphasis on, on building in a way, and I th in a, in, as, a, as Stan already said, um, it seems strange that even buildings uh, seem like a novel idea to discuss in architecture. You know, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are some who are going to rejoice, and then some who will scratch their heads probably for the same reasons as if as if buildings haven't been the subject matter all along. Um, so I think the question of discussing and, and looking at buildings, which I think is the core of, of this, of this uh, thing, um, I think we're, it's already been discussed a little bit, but I, I think part of it is how much, do we, how much do buildings convey themselves to some degree and how much do we project upon them? You know, what is the information in their structure, their repetition, their copying, et cetera, quotations? And, and for, for builders, I guess, if we think of this group as a group of builders, ultimately, um, uh, I, you can assume that they, the buildings uh, are, are the primary act, and uh, they, are, they are more important than and trump meaning or language or culture, uh, uh, and, and are understood in their own terms in, in relationship to other buildings and other objects. But this, this context of buildings is, is, um, uh, is, if we think about buildings in relationship to other buildings, it's necessarily limited, although it seems ever expanding these days. You know, the reference of architecture are inevitably shifting, and as such, constantly being reevaluated. And so in the end, nothing is, is um, stable. So the, the, mo the problem of how do we provide mechanisms for the evaluation of this discussion it seems strange that like the plan has reasserted itself in all the images that we've seen as a kind of dominant mode again. And part of this um, way that we're thinking about or how we discuss, discuss buildings, to me I, it kind of also can, can 
give the effect of, I mean, I, I haven't sat through a lecture where someone was doing like A, B, A, A, B in a long time. And um, give the effect that we are all kind of trying to go back to some degree to a kind of foundational uh, model for discussing buildings, uh, kind of this, this uh, kind of search for autonomy again, if anything, like this. All these things kind of scare the crap out of me. So the, and I would say, you know, it's hard for me to understand where where this goes, and I, I was even it's impossible to even given the presentations to 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 sort of mount a coherent response. I would just say, personally, that I've been so um, I think maybe it's the explosion of the the internet or some. There was a, some point in our history where where everyone would say, "I'm not interested in architects. I'm interested in buildings." I think in the '90s, or at least for me, I remember this moment, and. And I, and I find like the, there was a kind of model where everything, uh, the focus of attention was, and it is now, like it's against architects, somehow we think, need to think about the buildings themselves as the object. And, I, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested <laughs> these days in bodies of work than I am buildings. I think buildings um, themselves are kind of, don't offer much, except we can get really into the nitty gritty of how things are. I mean, I, I could spend, you know, I love, you know, details, shop talk. We can figure out how things get built and all the, all the things like this. But, I, you know, there's been something where, let's say, practices, I've been thinking about this recently, like for me, like not to name names, but like Herzog and de Muron has become, has become just like the best corporate office in the world. They're just like a, they can do anything. Uh, they can do it, the copy better than the original. Um, and... And they, they're, it's hard for me to understand the body of work. It's just become so diffuse and so large, it's kind of evaded uh, a kind of idea of body of work. And, and it's like, they're, for me, they've become just like a kind of Swiss Philip Johnson. And, and the thing that I really liked about Philip Johnson was just everything was bad. You know, it was like kind of bad copies. So I don't know what that, where that leads us, but. I would say I'd be more interested in framing the discussion less around buildings than bodies of work um, in the end. As a polemic, I guess I'll just throw that out there. Uh, and I think it changes the shift of originality and the locus of it. And, the, and also, it will it maybe shifts it back towards the practice of architecture as opposed to the idea of the building. So let's just throw that. If I have to be polemical somehow. As a, as a response. Okay, so may I invite all the speakers up to the table, please? Okay, so we have um, <laughs> feedback. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have a little. We have about twenty um, five thirty minutes for discussion. Um, thank you all for some wonderful presentations this morning. I, you know, thought I, coming in that I was going to need some coffee, but in fact, you know, I didn't. <laughs> Um, the, it was the, the, the presentations were pure jet fuel as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Um, I wanted to maybe start, um, uh, so the format will just be a loose conversation, but maybe I can just throw some ideas out there and we can, and we can all you know, feel free to jump in whenever you, you would like. Um, but I was very interested in this idea that Enrique put on the table, which I think found echoes sort of retroactively in a lot of the presentations of the difficult whole. Um, and uh, well, I said you put it on the table. I didn't say it was yours. <laughs> um, but I think what it leads to is a, is a notion of the of the the difficulty of synthesis, you know, and the categories of synthesis that, that we use. I mean, and uh, uh, Michael invoked some of those in terms of, you know, the plan uh, as providing, you know, sort of uh, evidence of, of that synthesis or, 
or the various um, you know um, design uh, conventions of, uh, his, of of various historical periods like the the ABA sort of typological uh, rhythm and so on. But I think that this idea of the the difficulty of synthesis is is interesting for us to explore in relationship also to Stan's idea that buildings provoke responses and effects um, and and to begin to discuss those because in a way that what it made me think about is if we're talking about the building and Michael had us think about uh, let's say the body of work um, a very simple question would be like where does the building end you know uh, we have a lot of stories of, of beginnings you know but where where does the building end um, does it end, uh, you know, physically uh, at the site? Does it end in time? Does it end in its reproductions? Um, does it end in conversation? Does it, does it not end? And therefore, it's. Uh, so I just would like some some thoughts, and maybe Stan, uh, if you'd like to to begin, or uh, since since we heard from you first, and. Uh, but of course, anybody else that would like to jump in after would be great. Sure. I mean, I think. I mean, I think this is a, this is an important kind of opening up, and and, and again, it it points to one of those capacities of building that 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 doesn't exist in in the project. That that is to say that the the building has a long life in time, and um, it, over and and I think I think there there one one of the difficulties is that. In, in the academic context, and in a lot of recent design discourse, there's a huge amount of discussion about process as design process, with the building as the end result of that design process. Whereas, you know, I think the, the, the question of process, and, and, and I think here's, here's where the building opens up also to the kind of larger urban field. Um, the, the life of the building actually starts when it's complete. And, it's the, the, the ability of the building to exist in the world and exist in the kind of larger social and urban uh, context that can then potentially trigger those kind of complex effects over the long, the long, long life of the building. Um, so uh, um, I'm very, very sympathetic with that, um, although I have to say, uh, again, just to, to I share it, when, when, when Michael says he gets nervous that the Turn to the building, and I'm I'm glad you were the one to, to signal the the in the yeah. in the title of the conference. That uh, I'd I'd rather talk about buildings, buildings or or yeah. even building as a verb rather than some sort of singular notion of the building, um, and uh, that uh, so so again just to reiterate this point, and and I think by signaling the sort of long life of the building in the world beyond the control of its author. Um, you, you do open up um, to some notion of the building that isn't about returning to, to, to ideas of, of essentialism or autonomy. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? Because yeah. I think that another way to qualify that or move away from the the, and I think this gets it a little bit what Stan talked about, but the, and certainly part of my preoccupation into questioning the singularity, because I think the, the singularity, I think Stan, your notion of process as embedded within the designed object as well as the design leading up to the completion of the object. But I think also for me, you know, that the Burns building is really just a vessel for a way to talk about how do we even acknowledge that as a singularity. Like it becomes very problematic to think about that as any kind of singularity. And I think this is where lowered like like if we think about, you know, FATS Museum of Copying, I think there's a lot of practices questioning this right now. And I think, so for me, part of the answer to that in terms of the trajectory of past versus future is maybe a kind of disintegration to some degree of that moment of building itself, right? As, a, as something that can be precisely located as even distinct from or anticipating other things. Maybe that's getting a little too blurry, but it also strikes me that, you know, I think one thing that, um, presentation, I forget who talked about anxiety so much. Who's was so anxious? Oh, Aaron's, right? Yeah, right. Yes. And I think, in this, I'm going to open up to a whole bunch of stuff, and maybe we can talk. I think that, yeah. so the looming of, of the kind of Bloomian framework of anxiety and reference, and certainly that informs some of my thinking as I'm trying to move away from it. Um, but I think it also, I just want to bring up the notion also that was brought forth at the beginning in uh, Jose's introduction about 
the need to then be able to articulate something outside of who we are as architects. The idea that just to talk about building is not enough, presumably, because it has to then define a framework which we can then use, that other people can use, so we're going to be exporting instead of importing, right? So there's yeah. a kind of insecurity, disciplinary, I think, there, that we, if we can come up with something that other people can use as frameworks for their disciplines, that will be the kind of validation of, our, of building, right? The export-import thing at the beginning really was weird to me. I mean, it's, it sort of sets up it sets up this kind of inside-outside again, mm -hmm. and it's part of somehow with that becomes autonomy. And I, and I, I, um, I, to me, that the idea that we keep thinking that there's such a strong inside and a strong outside seems to be part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was trying to figure out what Bernard thought when you were presenting. That's so weird to me <laughs> to present to the architect. That could, would be anxious too. But, but the, the, Aaron, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, to speak to this inside-outside, I mean, the, ins uh, the inside-outside only seems like a problem if you feel like you have to choose. I mean, as, as, long yeah. as, you, yeah. as long as you can just remain anxious about that and actually just mobilize the anxiety of, well, our, our, our discipline is not defined enough. What is, the, what is the kind of essential element? Well, as soon as we define that, how does that element speak to other disciplines or other practices? As soon as you can, as long as you can just keep, I mean, that's what I love about. Anxiety about would be the, one way to deal with it, though, but you could sure. also just be casual. And I, and, but and, I, and maybe it's the, it's the method uh, that Bernard's building was uh, teaching me about one method. Yeah. I mean, this is one reason to look at buildings. This, they, uh, they're not just whatever you hope they might be. They push back against you. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So in relationship to, to this balance of inside and outside, uh, Costandis, I, I wanted to ask you, you presented this notion of the library as a sort of architectural um, unfolding of a relationship to an object. Right, like the book or the the, not the stacks of books, uh, which had in a way echoes and resonances to Enrique's discussion of, of architecture uh, as a found or building as a found object and architecture as a sort of reorganizing of the relationship to that object. So, if the object that we relate to can be a book or can be a, a sort of existing structure. Could you discuss a little bit more, you know, what, what, what the nature of those relationships that architecture is able to, um, uh, to let's say, unpack or to organize or to control or, or maybe at least, you know, generate? Uh, and do they have limits, let's say, in terms of, uh, let's say, is, in terms of the object? Uh, is the building, uh, can the building be a book? Can the building... You know, if, if the building is a found object, let's say, uh, as, a, as one mode of defini defining it could, yeah. it, could it be a book? Well, uh, first I think that once you try to, uh, you know, draw the limits of this um, uh, uh, kind of uh, relations between the physicality of the object and the world of ideas that can act as a, as a reference, uh, then that's, uh, that's that's a way to put an end in the discussion and, uh, uh, you know, stop, uh, I mean, then having, you know, the problematic building that won't let you unpack other possibilities that um, could be unpacked. So, uh, what I think is very interesting in, in, in uh, this, let's say, paradigm of the library is that uh, it kind of escapes these two sides, like, uh, are you, uh, out or inside of the, of the discipline by uh, relying both on the physicality of the single object and the play of you know uh, constructing something uh, based on singular elements a very um, physical architectural uh, idea of piling up things and um, on the impossibility of you know imaginary worlds of uh, uh, eternal spirals that uh, would keep accumulating stuff or keep um, um, expanding um, in an impossible way the, uh, uh, you know, the potential of physical space. Um, so I think that uh, what's basically interesting um, in this um, controversy between the, the physicality of the object uh, and um, the imaginary eternal world, uh, world is the fact that the buildings uh, act as just moments where 
this impossible controver controversy just registered uh, on the ground. Um, and so the, uh, to relate to your first uh, question, where does the building end? Well, it doesn't end. I mean, it's just a register of this um, uh, impossibility of getting together these different uh, worlds uh, on the ground that's, that ends in the next building, in the, reg in the next register of this um, you know, uh, in and out game. So, Enrique, maybe if, I don't know if you would like to respond to that. Um, I, I had a comment in relation to the first question that I thought was also very, um, very useful. Um, you basically about um, two things. One, uh, that I, it was already insinuated by Stan. I think that one of the the, um, the issues regarding discussing building uh, is that uh, we can put a distance from product insofar as in academia we have uh, a tight relationship between <coughs> product and process. And in fact, that that's a topic that you already uh, discussed. That I think was implicit in my presentation. The fact that um, I mean, I know this is more on the doctoral uh, uh, problem with the building rather than on studio, but on studio we have a number of other issues with building, one of which is in fact our uh, incredible reliance on teaching process where you go to a, from A to Z through regulated steps that preclude and repress any form of decision making, which is why basically uh, the kind of uh, negotiations are out and there was always a belief, and this has been reincarnated in different ways in, in studio teaching, um, how you go from one point to another and aspire to something which is optimization. Uh, in fact, that's the last incarn incarnation of this uh, uh, problem, where basically a design is fine if you claim that you haven't done it. Um, in fact, yeah, there's a certain, uh, in, a, in, in other words, it, it happened. The, the argument about building is that, uh, that it deals, in fact, uh, there's a number of notions of resolution that have nothing to do with, it's not basically already dictated by the project. But there's things, which is why I love, let's say, the the banal question of the coal bridge as to do we keep the columns in, in concrete while having uh, our uh, building, uh, our, our kind of clients uh, subjected to a cold or extraordinary heating, or do we uh, change the system to be uh, consistent as architects and they simply kind of uh, um, not only uh, do it, but in fact declare it uh, in a drawing in, in, their, mm -hmm. in their project. In fact, they acknowledge something that we don't often teach in in studio culture, which is that design is by definition compromised. And it's interesting enough, I would say, that of all the things that have been discussed about Venturi's legacy as a book, that has not been discussed intensely. The fact that uh, what he advances is really a definition of what design implies, which is mm -hmm. that a product by definition implies a number of constraints that enter into a conflict, and that conflict cannot be solved. It has to be basically, um, it requires tools of negotiation. He does it in design, others do it at different yeah. uh, No, I, I mean, I agree with that. I'm very sympathetic with it. There's a, there's a brilliant the moment, not in complexity and contradiction, not, right. not in complexity and contradiction, but in learning from Las Vegas, where they say, basically, we do it this way because we don't want to design the project twice, once for ourselves and once for, for, for reality. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm also a little bit, I mean, when you open the discussion up to the studio, I'm a little bit reluctant because that's precisely the one thing you can't simulate. Right. And, and attempts to simulate that in the design studio have been somewhat unsuccessful, yeah. I, I, I think. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember this period in the 1970s. I mean, the, 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 the incredible irony that, that uh, uh, what Leon Creer would declare, I don't build because I'm an architect, as the exact same time that Liebeskin would, would say building, uh, uh, architecture begins and ends in drawing. So you had people from completely opposite uh, um, uh, points of view, uh, ideologically declaring that, that the, the project is sufficient uh, uh, description of, of, of the architecture and is precisely the suspicion of the problem of compromise. Right. Uh, that, that is, I think, what was underlying that, that anxiety there. So. It's an interesting segue into the thing that sort of the, the, the white or 500 pound gorilla, I, like, I prefer that to Atlanta Flint, sort of, um, which is the distinction between architecture and building, you know. Uh, and it, it, it's interesting to me if we look at copyright, since we are working on an issue on copyright uh, for future interior. That, that the legal definition uh, of architecture is an expression that can take form through building or drawings, 
or any other medium. So uh, it's a very loose definition of architecture where building figures as one of many possible, as a medium, really, as a medium of expression. Uh, and so with that, um, I wanted to, to go back to, to um, Enrique's idea about efficiency and that, that, that architecture, in a sense, overshoots in some way efficiency, either because it's a sort of unresolved compromise, but also in that overshooting that there is some sort of, I mean, we tend to think of that overshooting as a concept, as an idea, right? And that's where Venturi sort of grasps that as an idea. And so I'm going to ask you to hold on to that thought uh, uh, to, um, uh, to ask uh, Gabriella. Uh, you were so careful to describe through, the, through the, these plans, you gave us so little of the Wolf House, uh, this concept. So uh, would you, and I was thinking the Wolf House and the Wolf Man, I don't know if they have any relation, but... Uh, <laughs> and the, that's right. And so would you, would you, could you expand a little bit on how you see the role of, of, um, of intellectuality in this negotiation between uh, what is architecture and what is building, what overshoots uh, one and the other. Yeah, I think that this uh, this particular house and even this pr particular practice was an interesting one for me because I think this this house is sort of an example of uh, maybe a concept or or an architectural idea found in the resolution of the building and probably not in sort of prior ideas. So. Uh, it's very tempting to go and, and look for uh, those practices or th those building practices that are filled with ideas and then you sort of decant it in a building and see what comes out of it. And, uh, and I think that the, in this case, we, we are not sure if there were any sort of these uh, big ideas of, about architecture or about uh, the discipline when they were resolving this particular space. Uh, but I do think that it's uh, that there is a, a finding there, and that's through the resolution, through the architectural resolution. And in that in that sense, there the building is fundamental for finding that. It, it doesn't happen uh, in concepts. So the building precedes the idea. I, maybe they come together. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure how the building was designed or how the ideas came to be, but uh, uh, certainly the literature uh, around this particular building isn't very enlightening regarding the ideas. But the fact that we can discuss about a wolf uh, or a wolf uh, uh, and get sort of uh, material for further discussion is uh, what I find uh, interesting about it, and interesting about this particular problem that we are set uh, here I, uh, to, yeah. The one thing I would say is when you were presenting the plans, I kept thinking about Porto. Mm -hmm. You know, the plan is very similar to Porto and some other things. So mm -hmm. I, I think if you if you look at it through the plan and you think about architecture through buildings, inevitably there's a certain currency in those mediums that you can start to compare things but if you start thinking about it through bodies of work, you would never confuse Pezzo and OMA or something. You know, they're just very different You mean stakes. they graphically? I, organizationally, mm -hmm. uh, like when you're planometrically, I suppose, ultimately, you could start to compare those. I mean, at least I, I was doing that. And they, and, they would, and they also cheated in their plans, too. Like the fact that they took out, they didn't poche those two beds, that wall, means they were even trying to produce the effect of something like a, like the Porto where you have, let's say, a figure trapped in a figure, or the space between two figures, potentially. And so there's sort of, there were sort of little graphic games that they were playing, which are planned games. They're not building games for me. The, the, yes. Yeah, the original plan is the first one. I was emphasizing the second one. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. what I mean. And you started to draw those walls to show what was kind of hidden. So maybe the, I'm interested, and I wanted to follow up, if you don't mind me acting yeah. like a moderator for a second. Um, <laughs> I, but I didn't have a chair, so now we're I'm kind of we're conflating our positions over here. Uh, but I think because as you were talking, I was thinking about the the notion of 
by removing a sense of authorship, I mean, you're arguing that basically the building stands as an object in whatever we know about whatever their ideas were. Mm -hmm. I'm reading the object forward rather than trying to read backwards any concepts. And I think, Michael, your idea of the bodies of work, I'm just curious, does that emerge out of a kind of desire to reclaim a sort of authorship in some way within the realm of a discussion around building? Like, it allows us to talk Maybe. about yeah. building Copyright. with... I don't know, how does that... I guess I want to... I think it's interesting. I feel like it just... Um, resists, I, I feel like now, a days, everything has become a kind of incredibly diffuse field of buildings in architecture, that everything is a kind of individual symptom and copies and cliches and all the things that we're mm -hmm. talking about that it kind of float through the internet and on mm -hmm, our screens. Mm -hmm. And and the, the body of work is maybe some, uh, I don't know what the model is, but it's some way of working. It's not a resistant model, but it's just a kind of way of, of maybe it is, I don't know, kind of authorship or something like this. I, I guess maybe. The re instantiation of the architect at the center of this to some degree. Um, but but I'm, I mean, I'm curious of that. If I mean, in, in the case of yours and Hillary's work, yeah. um, it's, actually a, it's actually a very diverse body, right? I mean, there's built work, mm -hmm. there are projects, there are yeah. installations, there are experiments mm -hmm. with, yeah, with yeah, um, yeah. scripting yeah. so 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 another so by by but but well yeah but can you talk more about that that by bringing the the notion of the of the body of work in instead of the building you're certainly not talking about some sort of very recognizable authored consistency are are you <laughs> <laughs> i'm i think i'm talking about some some way that it Hold together, even if it's all different things, and maybe yeah. take time. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. the reality is, it's a it's um, somehow you it's maybe hard to judge in the uh -huh. at this point and uh -huh. where we're going with it, but um, you could start to understand the the the, the pieces uh, next to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to all be the same, but they're going to there is some there's something that is built through the space between all those pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're interested in doing, uh, if we have houses and the, uh, we're working through the, those we're, and we're doing furniture and tchotchke type stuff, there are similar things at stake in, in our minds, mm -hmm. certain similar problems, although they may be working through it in a different way. So, right. um, and trying to find other, you know, other uh, uh, ways to, to let's say play, I don't know. I don't. You know, yeah. Anyway. No, but there's a multiplicity that can enter you know, into the body of work. Yeah, of as course. Well as I'm not talking about like yeah, your, yeah, yeah. But I, and sure. I, I, you know, I, I just I am concerned about this idea that the f the field has become kind of uh, everybody is just producing the catalog of everything. Like mm -hmm. every practice mm -hmm. now is just doing everything, and I feel like that's a disillusion of a of a of um, it just becomes this arms race to see who's building more, and it seems like there's less at stake. Aaron. But the, um, yeah, so the, I mean, I'm just trying to tie the body of work conversation to the compromises conversation. I mean, it yeah. seems like one thing the body of work does is allow cross comparisons, yeah. but with enough commonality to where the compromises uh, start to be highlighted, um, instead of things that can seem kind of radically irreducible uh, start to, um, but I mean, this would be, this for me would be another definition of where does the where does the building end? It ends with whatever it uh, refuses to compromise on, or something. Uh, yeah. I think that's a really good point. That basically it would mean that if you understand the the Freud by definition as a, a difficult hole, the yes. right. you become an architect right. uh, afresh with every project. Yeah, but right. but then the interesting thing is that uh, it was kind of the question I was going to ask. At, at some point in your career, you start looking back and what you've done start basically announcing what you'll do, or uh, as uh, just now in uh, ah. editing an interview with, uh, with Mirai's that I did before he died, and basically he mentioned that uh, there's a number of things I'd like to do, but I, I just can't. Of course. Um, <laughs> in other words, you're limited by yeah. your own. Uh, like sleeping, probably. <laughs> of course. I think that's, you can't do everything. I mean, so, I think there, that's what the body work does. It has a sort of general, it's a, dif a difficult hole, perhaps, yeah. in a different way. Yeah. So. Um, I can't, you can't all of a sudden do, if I could wake up one morning and start doing Zaha Hadid, <laughs> you know, or something. You know I what I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah. If I could maybe ask uh, uh, Amanda to, to chime in here, uh, you opened your com uh, your presentation with this uh, with this question of how does 
architecture understand its relationship to itself, which I suppose meant also how do architects understand their relationship to their own practice and to, mm -hmm. and to building. Uh, and then you left us with this idea that, that maybe um, a copy, sort of the thing that seems the most derivative, mm -hmm. could actually be a way to, to understand uh, how something expands or gains value mm -hmm. over time. So mm -hmm. in relationship perhaps to this notion of the body of, of work. Right. Um, so certainly this was meant as a provocation and I, and I think coming back to Michael's first comments about um, you know, how do we, this notion of the kind of mechanics of um, even a kind of vocabulary through which to talk about questions of attribution and I think all this, mm -hmm. uh, as we emerge from a uh, postmodern hangover, I think we're, and many people are starting to talk about this in interesting ways, so part of my interest just comes in how do we even talk about this and what yeah. are the words, that, you know, and I've been drawn, actually I've been reading a lot of Renaissance scholarship because it's, it's fascinating because there's, there's none of this anxiety when not only the, the referent itself, but the fact that the reference is in play is a given. And then you can start to talk about the ways in which that referential operation works, right, in a very kind of productive way. So, so and I think the provocation of the copy as the place that seems um, most problematic but potentially offers a way to talk about it only because it's so, one has to talk about it, right? Because so then, it, then you can start to evaluate the ways in which the copy is made as potentially a kind of framework to think about this question of referent more broadly, right? So I don't, I mean, one thing, this is moving off topic, but back to the body of work. I mean, I think I'm also, so then when I get nervous about, and maybe we all are too when you talk about the body of work, is now are we going to go back to another form of what architectural historians which used to do, which was, yeah. you know, the, the of complete, and here now we see, and we were just talking about graves earlier, like, oh, Monograph. here's the moment we move from the white work to the, you know, like, how do we, so that other sense of the yeah. body of work kind of makes me nervous too, yeah, like, sure. how do we rethink, yeah, but I think this, actually the framing of the difficult hole, rather than a desire to kind of explain at every moment a kind of logical move that leads yeah. to some yeah. Rejoicing, yeah, as you yeah, said, right? Yeah. There's, we don't have to have rejoicing yeah. in order to talk about a body of work, right? Or redemptive, or I mean, typically, I think those narratives were framed as, <laughs> yeah. moving, you know, as a kind of there were moments, maybe mistakes, or but there was a sense of the kind of lesser and better work, and I think maybe even getting away from that sensibility is part of the yeah. interest, also in locating the moments of the multiplicitous buildings within the body of work. Yeah, right? and I, I know we want to open it up, but mm -hmm. very, very, very quickly, I think the other thing. Uh, that's implied in that is is a kind of conversational model of the discipline itself, <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. of architects working on similar pro. I mean, that was aside from showing one of my projects in that context. Mm -hmm. That was really what I wanted to open up mm -hmm. is that um, that uh, there are similar concerns that groups of architects share, and in the kind of exchange of information among projects that conversation gets opened up to, to multiple authors mm -hmm. uh, working mm -hmm. on similar problems. Mm -hmm. so you think, I think also what you were saying, like the, let's say the technique-based model or the, uh, that you were talking about the optimization model really is still indebted to um, the struggle for originality mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what you're talking about through the copy is probably more of the conversational yeah. model. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. less of that, mm -hmm. the originality model mm -hmm. probably shuts down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. sort of cultural conversation <laughs> at some level, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> I don't know. So let's open it up. We have a couple questions from Maria first, and then Bernard has a question as well. Um, hello? Yes, it's Marta. Or comments, okay. it doesn't have to be a question, by the way. So I'm Marta Caldera, and um, thank you very much for all your presentations and the very stimulating start to, to the discussion. And I would like to pick up on what it seems to me to be like the two poles of the discussion so far, which is between the compromise and the, the provocative uh, uh, suggestion uh, of the body of work. And between these two, to consider them then in the frame of, uh, the, of the symposium today in terms of, of um, the dialogue of bodies of knowledge, so sort of like a third term into the mix. And, and so in here then uh, I think it will become a, a two-part question, which is you know, to take on uh, first the notion of the body of work and to ask then uh, to what an extent does it really displace or, or shifts from the building when we're talking about disciplinarity? Uh, because if there is someone that I hear a lot like talking about bodies of work 
is, for instance, Eisenman, right? And we know where he stands in terms of a discourse of autonomy. So, so if the building makes you nervous in terms of you know, bringing back or evoking notions of autonomy to what an extent, you know, does the body of work then really escape uh, that uh, notion as well? Whereas the compromise then, it, it seems to me that that's where there might be then opportunities uh, to see then architecture or design or the building then in dialogue then with other forces that participate that come in to, that force themselves into uh, architecture and, and that might come then from the outside. So if, like, if the comparative mode would allow, you know, to, on the one hand to identify, as Aaron was suggesting, then what could be like the authorship of an architect, but it can also then, on the other hand, by focusing on the compromises, then also open up the buildings then to these other moments and where architecture is put in dialogue with knowledge is outside of it. So I think that's... I, I just want to respond about the Eisman thing. The, the, um, um, I, I would say that there, I wouldn't confuse body of work with... you like anxious. Yeah, I'm anxious all of a sudden. But like the... Um, um, Good. I'm, all, I'm actually uh, probably always yeah. anxious. But like the, the, um, the, the body of work is, shouldn't be confused with the project. I don't think it's mm. the same thing. Um, I think the body of work is much looser is the way I'm thinking about it at least, and I'm just throwing this out here for this uh, sim symposium in a way. The, um, the, the project in the Eismanian model is that you have, you know, you have a PhD and then you do architecture, which to me is like the worst idea ever. <laughs> so the, I, I wouldn't want to confuse that uh, with what the body of work is trying to, to, to say. I mean, when I throw that out there, I mean it to produce a kind of I think a more open uh, model, and it, probably in a way, m more the way that architects actually work. So. Well, uh, sorry, Jorge, I just would like, like follow to, to follow up on that because I was not really referring to Eisenman as his career, but more in his relentless investigation of architects in terms of their careers rather than precise objects, and that's what I was referring to. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, first, I, I, I thought the discussion and the presentations, the respective presentations by the panel were extraordinary because they were all responding to one another in a way and building up really a good conversation. Uh, inevitably, now I have to address uh, Aaron White's uh, uh, points, which I think he's been an incredible detective because he never talked to me, nor did I expect <laughs> him to do that work. I just discovered it right now. You're not supposed to resolve uh, that. Yeah. So the fascination, uh, and he's been actually, Aaron, you've been very good, right? I, I, I think uh, you found out where the corpses are, the skeleton in the closet, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, but I'd like to may maybe to qualify a couple of things, especially in terms of the, the notion of constraints, compromise, and negotiations. By the way, your drawing of the stack bond bricks versus the Flemish bond, absolutely. But uh, let me explain. And maybe perhaps in terms of Enrique's conversation with the, uh, the, the, the house of, of uh, Kirsten Gers and David Van uh, Severin, um, they are constraints which are internal and constraints which are external. In other words, internal constraints are constraints indeed like, you know, the cold bridge. They, we all deal with that if you're an architect. Uh, you could say that the McKim, Mead and White master plan is also an internal constraint. It's a given. Right? And then you have external constraints, which, uh, in, uh, which can either have to do with, uh, now I'll talk about Learner Hall, with the period in which it is built, in the early 90s, when there was an enormous amount of anxiety, not on the part of the architect, there was, of course, a fair amount of that too, but uh, from society in a relationship to preservation. Mm -hmm. And we had people chaining themselves to the gates to prevent the glass wall from being built. Mm -hmm. So we had, uh, so there was, uh, and there was a client who had even more anxieties about this. 
And therefore, for example, you talk to the Flemish bond and the brick bond, uh, the, 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 um, the so-called uh, stack bond. The st I designed the stack bond, but the client absolutely requested the Flemish bond. That was part of the negotiation. I want something else in return. Every discussion was a negotiation, and you're absolutely correct that the ramps was just non-negotiable. It was unnegotiable. And everything else was a negotiation and with a committee of 17 people. And if you want, we can talk about this later. But I want to get back to that notion of the internal and external constraints, uh, because they are really uh, uh, very important, and they get back to call it autonomy as uh, Kirsten Gers would not, would refuse to call it, but would admit to it, right? Because that's what they're after. Uh, uh, those are self-imposed constraints of the architect, and that's part of the work. However, then there are external constraints where you have to be very clever in order to do, quoting Herzog and de Meuron, the tactic of judo, in order to take the strength of your opponent in order to defeat it or not defeat it. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, one of the reasons this is not a return to autonomy or something is because one has to start to include in the conversation somebody like the university trustees or like, uh, or like a community of people who are uh, historical <laughs> preservationists or whatnot. So I mean, that's one of the, th these, are, these are the tensions within the building uh, the reason the, the corpses, as he called them, can be, can be found is because they're not hidden. They're not stored away in the closet. They're in the building, manifested in the building. And um, there's a, I, I had to cut it, but everyone should go take a look at Bernard's building as they walk back to the subway station because there's a wonderful way in which the stacked Flemish bond uh, allows him to continue his kind of assault on McKim's uh, kind of distinction between frame and infill as the, as the different patterning now becomes a brick framing itself. Uh, so there's even a kind of mo a secondary mobilization of, of this kind of uh, dilemma, which I think the, the building helps create. That's one of the points I hope I made, is that the, the dilemma doesn't, doesn't always not, uh, merely precede the building, but the building animates the dilemma in, in a number of ways. So um, this has been a really wonderful uh, series of presentations to start the day in a very stimulating conversation. I want to thank all of you for your presentations and for your work, for the fantastic discussion. And um, now we have time for a little coffee. You don't have enough time to go see Bernard's building. It's only 15 minutes. You have to be back by noon. Aaron and Bernard can, uh, can sort it out in the meantime uh, during the coffee break. But thank you so much. Sí, pero además es, tiene que sí, ver con saber ser en